uh, right in front of MRPD. And it was who I would have to imagine was Hydra. I can't prove it, but I have a damn good grudge and hunch that it was them. For obvious reasons, but... Pullet looked at them and said, Get the fuck out of here. I'm talking with this guy. I've been waiting five hours to talk with this guy. And he started getting aggressive against them, and I said, Oh, hell no. Pullet's about to get fucking killed if he keeps this up. So I stepped in and said, pull it, stay out of it. And I looked at who I thought could have been Miguel. Can't prove it, but I, again, very strong hunch. Mm -hmm. And I said, Miguel, give me two minutes. And then I am yours. Because I wasn't running from six people. And I wasn't going anywhere. So I said, just give me two minutes. And I'll be good. And he goes, nope. You're coming with us. So I went to go walk away. Pullet started making comments. And I looked at him. I said, Pullet, stay out of it. Just stay safe. I don't even remember what I really said. I remember saying something to him. And he mm -hmm. went to reach for his phone. And everybody there pretty much told him, don't touch your phone. You'll, you'll regret it. So he watched me get loaded, or not even loaded, he watched me get into the trunk of a car. And then they shut it. And we started driving. And the conversation went as you would expect. You know, the PD, you know this, you know that. And I told him, I said, you realize that out of anybody who has the power and it, the, the word to actually make change. I am the one to do it. I said, have you ever heard me or seen me be the irrational guy? Have you ever heard me or seen me be the one who wasn't about the individual? Have you ever heard or seen me not be the one who uh, wasn't willing to put his best foot forward for sake of building a bridge between the police department and the individual. And the, I knew it was over when he said the words, I think we're past that point. And I, I knew where this was headed. And, uh, started going down a bumpy road. No, there, there was no way of telling where I was, but I started going down a bumpy road and we stopped at the peak of the nudist colony up there over by the lumber mill. Right. They popped the trunk and the conversation continued. And I told him again, I said, this isn't on me. And there's a lot of, of, you know, we and us and they. I said, I'm me. I looked at him and I said, Miguel, when have I ever wronged you? When have I ever done anything that would put you in a position? I said, you know, if there's anything I know, it's how to speak to an individual. I said, give me that opportunity. Don't waste that. And he asked me if I knew about uh, Remington's death. I read the report. Yeah. And I know what that top of that report said. And I told What's him that? nobody is to speak about Remington under any circumstance to anybody outside of the meeting room. Right. So I did what I knew how to do best. And that was honor that. Even if my life was held against my will, I gave him a very deadpan lie and told him no. And he said that right there is the exact problem with the PD. The fact that you had no idea. And I told him, and this is not untrue, 
I said, Miguel, this is the first time in three days I've spent more than three hours on duty. I said, I haven't been around. Which was true. Doesn't mean I didn't know about Remington, but I, I told him it was, it's, you know, it's impossible to communicate when you don't know. You don't, you're not around to talk to people. So he started going down his line and I cut him off and I said, can I ask a question? And he goes, yeah. I said, if this is going where I think this is going. Can I please have an opportunity to say goodbye? And if there's any reconciliation to what happened, not that this was good, but he actually gave me the privacy to make one phone call to say goodbye. And... Um, I was trying to figure out who the best person to call was. And I didn't know who was around, but I was going off duty to see Etta. And I figured if Maple was busy and he couldn't answer, that would have been a problem. If Ziggy wasn't around, that would have been a problem. I didn't know if you were around. I didn't know if Matt was around. But I knew Etta was around. So... I wanted to call Etta because our last conversation was... Uh, I don't want to say it was bad. It wasn't bad, but it just... It was emotional. I didn't want to let that be the last thing Etta knew of me. And I called, and I simply told her that I loved her. And that I hoped there was a time I would see her again. And she asked if I needed a pickup and where I was. And... My most gut-wrenching response was that I told her I wish I could tell her. And she asked me a question that only you would know, and only this family would actually know. And she said, Flop, is it a 1096? And I was afraid to give a yes or no next to about six gang members. And I gave a very long, broken sigh and said goodbye. And I hung the phone up. And <clears throat> they loaded me back into the trunk. We started driving again and who I thought was Miguel was driving he said you know flop the best version of you was when you were a park ranger and shortly after they popped the trunk I got out, and they told me to go meet my maker. Um, a mountain lion next to the tunnel. And I walked near it, and I had a split second where I looked back Just to look behind me. Thought the tunnel's right here. What are the odds? And I saw a gun trained to the back of my head. And 
all I thought was that if I get chewed out by a mountain lion and then left with a bullet in my head, I don't think we'd be having this conversation right now. And I'd like to think that I was sort of given a second chance at life because I was completely determined, Dad, that I would not be sitting here right now. And the mountain lion jumped on me and shredded me apart for God knows how long. It felt like forever, but... Fuck's sake. Um. And then everything went black. And. Uh, I mentioned that beginning part about pull it. Um. And uh, I asked Maple today, while giving my statement, I said, I asked him, I said, did Pullet call 911? The man trying to apply for a job at the police department watched me get loaded in the back of a car with a gang and did not call 911. What? You're shitting me. Good one for his resume. I spoke with Sky today. She came to the house to check in on me. She heard I was out. And, uh... I asked for Ziggy and Edda to step away and that it wasn't personal and I needed a word with my lieutenant. And I was told by Maple that apparently yesterday Sky ripped him a new asshole. And I told her about what happened with me. I said, are you aware that that man didn't call the police for me? And her words were, and I quote, for as long as I have a say in it, that man will never have a job here. Which... Personally, not my case, for obvious reasons. But I would have hit that man with accessory. Yeah, he deserves much more than losing a job. I think they had a chance to find me. And... Yeah, I agree. He wasted it. To think that I tried to save his life so that I had an alibi and a witness. It was the right thing to do. And it almost cost me everything. I think one of the only reasons it didn't cost you everything was because of who you are as a police officer, though. Mm -hmm. Was because of that respect you've gained over the years, because, let's be honest, if it was Den Shiesty or a cop of similar in a similar vein, do you think they would have let him have it out with a mountain lion? No. In fact Absolutely not. In fact, I forget if I didn't if I didn't mention this, I apologize. I asked them who the problem was and how I could resolve it, and they told me, and I quote, 
you can blame Den Shiesty. I think I'm the only officer that they've gotten a hold of that they didn't shoot. And not that that's brownie points, but I think it's very telling. But I think I bought myself a second chance at life. Yeah, I'm afraid you were just a message. Had to be. Did uh, anybody tell you about the tweet Miguel made afterwards? I, uh, I, I didn't read the report, but I was curious to see what evidence they had. Probably unprofessional of me, but I saw Esther it. Esther told me that Miguel made a tweet about you afterwards, so. Yeah, he says something about smoke that flop pack. Yeah, something childish anyway, yeah. Um, listen, I, uh, there's people working the case. I, uh, I made sure of it and I think that it was going to happen anyway, but I wanted to double check and it's good people. I won't, it's Riker. I don't know who else, but I know Riker's working it at least and I know they're you know, he's a good lad, and he's a he's a good detective too. So I trust Riker with everything. He's a good one. Yeah, he's a really good one. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I also wanted to make sure uh, Liz's case was being looked into too, and uh, he's assured me of that as well. Okay. Because, well, the PD hasn't exactly had a good track record with things lately. They they haven't. We fail to fulfill cases, and it shows. Mm -hmm. Um. I think uh, with everything that's gone on, uh, I told Sky something today that I'll tell you. And I'm not letting my emotions get to me. I'm giving time on this. Because I think time is what I need. But I told Sky, I said, I think I might need to take some time away. Um, maybe a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks. I don't know yet, but, um, I told her that I'm scared to do my job right now. I said that there's something dramatic about what I went through that, uh, scared me. And I don't know if it was a mix of feelings because of other things, other trauma that I've been dealing with, or if it was its own thing, but I said that if I was to ever be pulled over, or get pulled over by, I'm sorry, if I were to pull any of them over, uh, I don't think I would be able to handle myself. And I don't mean in a bad way. I mean, I don't. I think I'd be too scared to do my job and think on my feet. But I'm aware of that. And, uh... I've never felt that way before. I've never been scared to look at a mountain lion. But, here I am. Maybe a coward, maybe not. I 
I never thought I'd feel this way as an officer with all my years of experience, Ed. I was gone for four years. Uh, I was the assistant chief. Uh, whether I was a good one is a different question. You were a good one. The people that didn't think so. Uh, not the point. Not the point of the story. I'm sorry. Uh, you were a good leader. Don't let anyone tell you differently. I I spent a significant amount of time in Parsons in my early years as a police officer. After I was kidnapped and forcibly given narcotics and they tried to force me to uh, do a bunch of shit I didn't want to do. I was scared for a long time. That was a tough time in my life. I don't think I was ever not scared after that. But being scared doesn't make you a coward. Being scared, having fear, keeps you alive. No one's going to fault you for that. I want you scared, because I want you alive. Everybody does. I'd rather you be scared and making smart decisions than be fearless. I'm scared. Your dad's scared. Why do you think he's never been picked up before? Because he uses that fear and he's smart about it. It's just about taking some time and learning to control it. That's all it's going to take. is time and attention and love from the people around you like me and Jiggy and Rue and Etcher and your dad and just take all the time you need and even if it turns out in the end that you don't want to go back to work? No. Don't go back to work. Do what's right for you, man. Whatever choice you make, I'll support. Thank you. Jesus Christ. Drugs have been bad up here recently. Yeah. Um, Pretty bad. Yeah. I think right now what I need is time with family. I, I know Rue is worried yeah. and sick. I asked mm -hmm. a few members of the club. I actually just got done talking with Kelly Dean. I don't know if you've met Kelly, but... I don't know. He's a good one. He's, uh... I would say one of the more humble ones. But I asked him about Rue, and he's like... 
probably Rue's best friend. One of. Knows Rue very well. Um, I don't know if you know who Beach Crew was many years ago. No. Okay. They're kind of an offset to the BBMC, but I guess Kelly Dean and Rue were both around it. So they, they, they've known each other. They, they, they have history. And uh, Rue was, or I, I guess Kelly was saying that Rue has been doing about as quote-unquote good as she can be, which tells me that she hasn't been in the best of minds and... I, uh, I spoke to Rue. Uh, I, I spoke to Ziggy too. They were both. I mean, everybody was worried, but they were both worried pretty bad, as you can expect. I think, uh, I think Rue was struggling because... I guess it surprised me a little bit. I think Ziggy was feeling it pretty bad. And I didn't think she wanted to bother him. And reach out and talk to him about everything. And maybe they either they didn't get a chance or just didn't want to bother him because he was upset too. And... Then when I spoke to her, it was, she, she, I, I think she, she can't, she feels like she can't really speak to the club about it. Like she can't really, uh, express her emotions too well with those people. And then she kind of said something that I had to correct her on. Fuck. Because... <laughs> She basically said that she 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 values herself on her usefulness, and uh, you know, I had to tell her that's that's not how that works. <clears throat> that's not how her, you know she shouldn't be valued on her usefulness. She should just be valued as a as a member of the family, you know, not on her usefulness, whether that's part of the club or anything. She should just be valued, period. And uh, I don't know whether anyone's told her that before, and maybe that's why she's had trouble expressing herself around the club, and I don't know. But I think we had a pretty good chat yesterday, and yeah, I, uh, I think, you know, I spoke to her about not going... I did have to say the hard thing, but I made sure that she's not going to go for a bottle if it get if it got too rough, which I don't think she has. Um, she's really grown up. She's been doing a lot better. Yeah. Uh, I, I haven't seen her yet, so. I have uh, obligations to that that I want to make sure of sooner than later. But yeah, you think uh, what scared me the most? Asking about Rue. I would have hated, hated the thought of her losing another father so soon. But she's made so much progress. And I would have hated to throw that away. Do 
He's never going to be perfect. But no one's ever going to no. be perfect. No. No, she's a good kid, though. Yeah. A little rough around the edges, but... Didn't fit my criteria for my reasoning. But... I think, uh, and I'm going to make you aware of it so that you know. A little change of topic, but also a little relevant. On my medical chart, they never noted uh, my morphine addiction. And I was told that they were using morphine as a painkiller for me. Um, I maybe not today as much as I will tomorrow because I just got off of it and I'm still leaning off of it, but I was away from that shit for so many, so many years. And it wasn't the doctor's fault. I was clearly in pain, but... It's going to be hard to move past that next few days. How was that not on your chart? How did they miss that off? Many years ago, it was in my chart. It was sort of a word of mouth thing that people knew. Oh, for God's sake. Etta made sure it's in my chart now. <sighs> I can't blame the doctor for doing the right thing. It was my fault for not telling them any opportunity at the hospital prior about it. Or did I ask anybody? Before they gave you, like... Medicine? Probably not, right? Probably not. No. I know Edda wasn't Are they happy allergic about to it. peanuts as they feed you peanuts? No. Yeah, well, I, I think I can blame a doctor here. Yeah, I think I can. Um, yeah. I mean, it started off with Dr. Skip. And then it was Dr. Kizu who has been lovely to me, but he was just reading over my chart and let me know, so I don't know who was the one that administered it, but... Okay. You are an emergency contact. I'm sure if you want, you could probably ask. They could tell you. I don't want to go on duty with a muggy, mm -hmm. foggy mind, so. Okay, well, the same goes for you then, then it's been said that Sergi and Ro, if you feel yourself needing anything or slipping at all, then you ring somebody. Hmm. Don't try and do anything on your own. You said, uh, you said that the last conversation you had with Etta was a rough one. What was, why was that a rough one? Um,
That uh, was very emotional. She was scared. And it was, put simply, because uh, I don't want to misquote Etta, it was the kind of scared where what hurt me the most was not knowing how to comfort her. She was worried about losing the family. She was worried that people were going to have a big outburst. In her mind, she saw the end of everything. A little bit of a doom spiral, but at the same time, I hadn't talked to anybody, so I only had what Etta was telling me. And I... I didn't know what to say. And it broke my heart. And we were looking over the sunset down off of LSIA by the water. And the only thing I could do was be there for my sister. Um, while we had the conversation... Maple had been in the ICU. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it had to do with maybe emotions off of that. And more the fear of knowing Maple's in this position. I don't ever want to see it ever happen again. And I think she was valid in her, her being scared. And I'd honestly rather her be scared than not. Uh, otherwise, that, that would just culminate and build inside of her, and I don't want that for her. I'd rather her tell me when she needs to talk. But I was upset because I didn't know how to help. I felt helpless, so. Yeah. Okay. I, uh... That's why when I called her, I told her that I loved her uh, and that I wanted to see her again soon. And she even asked me on the phone, is this about our last conversation? And I said, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. All right. That's where I'm at right now, but I think right now it's road to recovery and mm -hmm. being with family and trying to do the right thing. So... I'm uh I'm sorry there's been a lot of uproar we'll say in the family. Well, it's not your fault, mate. I don't I think folks a strong word. Um what word? Fault. Mm. As in putting blame on anybody. Yeah. Because even to cause even to say it's you know Ziggy or or Rue's fault is is difficult because you know they've got their own reasons for doing things and they're in very difficult positions and. Everyone, I said it to Rue yesterday, and I didn't want to bring it up yesterday or the day before, whenever it was, 
but we're at the hospital with you there. At the end of the day, none of it matters because when we're at that hospital and we're looking at you on a hospital bed with strapped to machines with a tube down your throat, that's that's what we're trying to avoid. And that's the only reason there's any uproar in the first place. I didn't say that out loud. What I said out loud was that none of it matters. That's what matters. The only reason anybody's getting upset is because we don't want to be, we don't want anyone on those hospital beds. And we definitely don't want anybody on those hospital beds because of the actions of anybody else in the family. And that's all it boils down to. That's it. It's as simple as that. There's nothing more to it. I just want everybody to be okay. And if I can get that, I'm a happy man. You know I'll do everything in my power to do that. And I agree. When you really boil it down. The first time I dealt with trauma. Actual, real, egregious trauma in recent time. Was getting on duty. Responding to a shootout in Vespucci. And officers asking me, can you please identify if this is your husband and daughter in the back of this ambulance? Yeah. That's that, not something yeah. you should be having the do. I immediately had to go 42. I couldn't do it. I was afraid to look back and see them. And as you would expect, the bloody, messy the train wreck I had to see was just not, I don't know. And then when Maple was in the ICU, it came to me in fear. Yeah. And even Ziggy came to me with some fear. And I realized... And honestly, I guess I just couldn't find the words, but you put it perfectly that really what this boils down to is I think everybody just wants everyone to be safe and okay. Yeah, that's it. It's just that everyone's going to have their own ideals and morals, and some people like Ziggy and Rue are going to have their own, what's the word? Like, the cops in the family are going to have their morals. Mm -hmm. Ziggy and Rue might have their... I don't know what the word is, mm -hmm. but the club is going to have their grasp on them. Expectations? Expectations, right. So that they have a a duty, right? They have a duty to, to do... Um, so they're coming at it with a duty. The cops are coming at it with morals. And so there's going to be a clash of ideals there. Whereas it needs, needs to be bore down as Ziggy and Root don't want to hurt you guys. And you guys don't want to hurt them. And everyone's going to agree with that. And it just needs to be figured out. It just needs to be figured out as to what the best way that the family can make sure that that doesn't happen. Because is it an inevitability that if Rue is going to carry on being a, a criminal, a violent criminal, is it an inevitability that she's going to get involved in a shootout with police? 
Yeah, it probably is. So how are we going to manage that? Like, because if she's going to do that, then the, it might be inevitability. If you look at the, the probability as X tends to infinity, then, you know, if X equals Y, then Y is also going to tend to infinity, then, you know, you guys are going to clash at some point. That means at some point in one of those shootouts, Brew is going to be in a shootout and you are going to be in a shootout, which means there's going to be a chance that she's going to shoot you or you're going to shoot her. That's just 